Hi folks, I'm Dan Fullerton, and today I want to talk to you about the law of conservation of angular momentum. Our objectives for today are going to be to recognize the conditions under which angular momentum is conserved and relate this to systems such as satellite orbits, to state the relation between net torque and angular momentum, we'll get to that in just a moment, analyze problems in which the moment of inertia of an object is changed as it rotates freely about a fixed axis, and analyze a collision between a moving particle and a rigid object that can rotate. So with that, let's dive in and talk about the relationship between angular momentum and net torque. So let's start by considering the angular momentum about point Q for an object with some momentum P. The angular momentum about point Q, by definition, is going to be R cross P. All right, let's go a little further now. And if we take the derivative of both sides with respect to time, the derivative of angular momentum with respect to time about point Q, and the derivative of the right-hand side, well, to do this, we need to know how to take the derivative of a cross product. Here's the formula for it. The derivative for a cross product of A crossed with B is just going to be the derivative of A with respect to T crossed with B plus A crossed with the derivative of B with respect to T. So the left hand side is pretty straightforward. The derivative of angular momentum with respect to two, with respect to T is going to be the derivative with respect to T. And the right hand side becomes the derivative of R with respect to T crossed with momentum P plus R crossed with the derivative of momentum with respect to T. Now, looking at this a little bit further, this derivative of R with respect to T, derivative of position with respect to time, we call that velocity. So dr dt is our velocity vector. And the derivative of momentum with respect to time, we've already said the rate of change of momentum with respect to time gives you a force. So I could rewrite this now as the derivative of L about point Q with respect to T must be equal to, well, dr dt, that's V crossed with P plus, now we have R crossed with F. All right, notice here that we have velocity and momentum crossed with each other they're in the same direction since P equals mass times velocity. Velocity and momentum are in the same direction. So their cross product is going to be zero. Therefore, we can state that the derivative of angular momentum about point Q with respect to time is just going to be R crossed with F. And hopefully that looks a little bit familiar because we've already defined R cross F as our torque vector. Therefore, we can write that the derivative of angular momentum with respect to time about point Q is equal to the torque about that point Q. So what does this really mean? Well, a torque on an object is going to change its angular momentum, or vice versa, a change in angular momentum is caused by a torque. Okay, so there's the relationship between angular momentum and torque. Torque changes an object's angular momentum. So how about this conservation of angular momentum? Well, spin angular momentum, the product of an object's moment of inertia and its angular velocity about the center of mass, is conserved in a closed system with no external net torques applied. So as long as there are no external net torques, that spin angular momentum has to remain the same for that closed system. That's pretty profound, kind of like the conservation of linear momentum. In a closed system, linear momentum is also conserved. Let's see how we can apply that to a couple of interesting problems, starting with the ice skater problem. An ice skater spins with some specific angular velocity. As she spins, she pulls her arms and legs closer to her body, which reduces her moment of inertia to half of its original value. What's going to happen to her angular velocity and what happens to her rotational kinetic energy? Well, you have to remember, she pulls her arms and legs in, she reduces her moment of inertia. 
Since there's no external net torque, her spin angular momentum has to remain constant, the law of conservation of angular momentum. Therefore, her angular velocity must double since L equals I omega. If L is constant, I goes down, omega must go up. Now, rotational kinetic energy, on the other hand, is governed by kinetic energy is one-half I omega squared. If we have cut moment of inertia in half, and we have doubled angular velocity, which we had just determined, and that doubled is squared, well, we've got one-half times two squared, one-half times four. What we're actually going to end up doing is doubling her kinetic energy. But where did that energy come from? Well, think about it. If she's skating and her arms are way out there, she has to do work to pull her arms and legs in. The work that she did pulling those arms and legs in leads to the doubling of that kinetic energy. Let's take a look at one more problem. We have a disk with some moment of inertia I, and let's say that I is equal to one kilogram meter squared. It spins about an axle through its center of mass with an angular velocity of 10 radians per second. An identical disk over here, which is not rotating, is slid along the axle until it makes contact with the first disk. If those two disks then stick together, what is their combined angular velocity? This also is a conservation of angular, angular momentum problem because the initial angular momentum must equal the final angular momentum. The initial angular momentum, the initial moment of inertia times the initial angular velocity, therefore must equal the final moment of inertia times the final angular velocity. We want to know the final angular velocity, so I'll rearrange that to say final angular velocity equals initial moment of inertia times initial angular velocity divided by final moment of inertia. That we said was one kilogram meter squared times the initial angular velocity of 10 radians per second divided by the final moment of inertia, two kilogram meters squared since we have two disks. One times 10 divided by two tells me my final angular velocity must be five radians per second. And that should make some intuitive sense. If one of them spinning at 10 radians per second, the other identical disk is at zero, they combine with each other, you're gonna get half the angular velocity. Hopefully that gets you started on conservation of angular momentum. If you need more help or are looking for assistance, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.